irate, uh, but it wasn't, you know, we, we were making our guys think a lot. And when we broke down, a lot of times it wasn't a, a skill or execution problem, it was a mental problem, because we weren't sure where to be, uh, because we were changing up every week based on the rides we were seeing. So we simplified, we got rid of some of the things in our clear to make things a little bit easier for our guys skill-wise, and, and came up with a way to clear the ball where we could make very minor adjustments based on almost any ride that we're seeing. Um, I think one of the first things you gotta do, and, and this goes back to how you're building your program as much as it does to what you're doing with your clear, is figure out what your style is. What, what are you trying to do as a team? Uh, what are your strengths? What are your goals as a team? What do you want to accomplish? And then every part of the game, riding, clearing, man up, man down, how you're facing off, how you're playing offense and defense, everything has to fit into what those goals, your style, your capabilities, your opponents are. Uh, these guys alluded, Kenny just alluded a little bit to, uh, I think Casey did earlier too, when, when we first started as a varsity program, we had a pretty huge talent deficiency. So we did everything we could to slow the game down, everything we could. The way we ran man up, the way we rode, the way we cleared, the way we played defense, everything was designed to limit the number of possessions in a game because we wanted to come out of the season with our guys feeling like they weren't that far away from being competitive. We're getting more talented now, we're starting to change that up, getting to where we want to be, and that's what I mean, we're starting to design our style. I threw the teams up here that I did, uh, you know, we just saw a clip of Denver. Denver doesn't ride at all, they don't ride. They are, I think they were third to last in riding last year. They're very confident they have the best six on six team offensively in the nation, they probably do. So uh, they don't need to ride. They just want to get their right personnel on, get into six on six and play that way. Uh, Albany over there, ride really hard. They ride their asses off. They are one of the top five riding teams in the country. Uh, why? Because they want the ball in those guys' hands as much as they possibly can. They want a fast game, they want it up and down, they want transition, they want it to be a little bit sloppy because that's the game they're doing. We're trying to figure out where we are. Uh, we've always taken a lot of pride in the way we rode. As a club program, and I've talked about this before, uh, last time at the, I presented on our 10-man ride, and it's still my belief that anybody at a slightly lower level than where we are should be running a 10-man ride as their main ride all the time. I believe every high school team should. Uh, I believe every, every youth team that can run it should. As a club team, and it was a pretty high level of club lacrosse, we rode at 50%. That made a huge difference. We weren't always the best team, but we had the ball so much more than the other team. It was hard to lose, and it was because of that ride. The only Division I team that 10-man rides almost exclusively, and they've even backed off a little bit, is Bucknell. And if you look at the ride stats, they are number one in the nation in riding. Uh, and they do it for a number of reasons. One of their reasons, the way they 10-man ride, is to slow the game down. It takes longer to clear against their 10-man. These are just, uh, this is, uh, I, I'm gonna get into clearing in a second, but this is an example. Um, and, and as you're thinking through what's important to you in, in all the, the different aspects of the game. This is Tempo Free Lax, uh, where they, they quantify a, a lot of the statistical data to figure out where teams rank in offensive and defensive efficiency. Um, NCA doesn't track ride percentage, they do. This isn't necessarily perfect, but you can see Bucknell's up at the top. Um, we're in there, we're in the top 20. We, we, we pride ourselves in it, but we uh, we're not always, there's sometimes that we don't ride, there's sometimes we do, there's sometimes we run 10 man. Um, Virginia doesn't run much 10 man, but they uh, have freak athletes and they ride really hard and they're always gonna be up pretty high just because of the kind of athletes that they have and the emphasis they put on it. Um, but this is all, you can see that there are good teams kind of mixed throughout here. Uh, and, and it's based on the style of play they want. And the same thing happens with clearing. What you'll find though, in the clearing game at the highest levels, and I just took the, the top of this stat, this is from NCA stats, uh, at the highest levels, there's not a whole lot of difference. The best clearing teams are not clearing the ball a whole lot better than the teams in the middle. Uh, there's, there's a, a tenth of a, there's a percentage point difference a lot of times um, between you know, number 20 and number 30. So uh, everybody at this level clears really, really well. But the times you don't clear is what's important. Because the times you don't clear, you're giving a possession up. And those are what hurt you. Uh, we played Ohio State last year down there, 
and we're in a one-goal game in the third quarter and failed to clear three out of four times in the third quarter, and suddenly we were not in a close game anymore. And we're one of the better clearing teams in the country. So and we just made those three mistakes, and those came back and, and crushed us. So that's why we put so much into what we're doing in our clear. It's why we've simplified it. Uh, our objective is to clear the ball every time. We want to clear the ball every time. We think we should be able to clear the ball every time. We've had games where we have. Um, this year, as we get better, we're pushing transition more, but pushing transition more doesn't mean giving up clears. There are certain situations where you can hit transition and find it uh, and take advantage of that. And then once that isn't there, you can still have a base clear that can be very, very successful for you, and that's the way we're doing it now. And that's what I'm going to walk you through. Things to think about, uh, and this is all, this kind of applies to riding and clearing, actually, but uh, it's not just about getting the ball from one end of the field to the other or stopping the other team from doing that. Um, told you Denver bases their riding and clearing game basically on the fact that they think their six on six offense is so good. That's their main focus, so they don't bother with the rest of it that much. Uh, what kind of pace do we want to play? We're trying to play a little bit faster now than we were when we were trying to play slow. We, we did all this a little bit differently. In our clearing game, when we were trying to play slow, there were times, we we're still a really good clearing team, there were times that we didn't take a clear when we had it because we wanted to take more time, reverse the field, get it up the other side. So we, take, we wanted to average about 23, 24 seconds on a clear uh, and, not use, and, and use as much of that whole 30 as we could. We do that throughout the course of a game. Maybe we're cutting six, seven, eight possessions out of the game. Um, are you looking to create transition or not? Again, when we weren't as talented, we weren't. I think if you added up the number of true transition opportunities we had last year in the entire season as a team, you could probably count them on two hands. Uh, in our Fairfield scrimmage this fall, we had 12 in the game, in one game. So now we're trying to push it more, and we're coaching that way. Um, do you have two-way mids or specialists? That obviously changes the way you're doing this. Does the other team? What are their personnel like? Are you trying to trap guys? They're offensive guys. The way you clear can trap them. So where you're putting them, if they're riding. If they're not riding, you can't trap them. Um, obviously, and especially at lower levels, how athletic is your goalie, your defenders? How are their sticks? Uh, the way we clear now, our, our guys all have to have great sticks, obviously. But the way we clear now, it's taken a lot of pressure off of our defenders and their stick skills and made it a lot simpler for them. And we'll talk about that. Um, and do you have punt returners? Do you have the kind of guys who can run through people? And it doesn't mean that we want guys running end to end. We don't do that very often. Uh, but we do set the guys up who are our best athletes who can carry the ball the best in situations where they can beat one guy and get out and, or slalom two guys and get out. And, uh, and we do set up situations to give those guys those opportunities. All right, uh, we see a lot of different clearing formations, and mostly I'm going to talk now about getting into your settled clear. So we've, I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot about transition. That's another talk. So you, you know, you've broken out. Um, you, you're now you're not getting transition. You get settled, and how do you clear the ball? And there are a lot of different ways to do this. And um, you know, Connor was talking a little bit about offensive formations. We see a ton of formations in the clearing game as well. These are some common ones we see. That's a 3-3-1. That's a three, three, one. one of the major differences that you're going to see between different clearing formations is how many guys are back here. When I was playing lacrosse, almost everybody cleared with a four across, which you never see anymore, right, with all 3-D and the goalie across here. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, the, now you see a lot of three across, and we see a lot of three across at our level as well, mostly three across. This is a really common one at the Division I level. Uh, getting into a diamond early and then shifting. They'll sub the pole off and get into a 3 2 2. Those guys up top could be pinched like I have them or they could be wide. That's a very common motion. A 3 4, we see this sometimes. There could be some motions in this. Guys could be exchanging but keeping the guys all kind of across the midfield. Uh, this is basically the clearing formation we use now. This is the base set of it. A number of teams use this. Uh, there's a major difference between the way we're doing it now and this, which we'll show in a second, but uh, Johns Hopkins clears this way. A lot of teams clear this way now. Biggest difference, two guys down instead of three. 
right? So they've taken, in this formation, they've taken that defender. They were D, goalie D. They've taken this defender, brought him up. We call it bonus. That's the bonus guy. Uh, and, and gone two across. Now, the reason you do that, and I told you you want to take pressure off guys' sticks, right? The reason you do that is to get rid of the overpass, the sideline to sideline overpass, right? It's a tough pass. It's a tough pass at the highest levels. It's a really tough pass at lower levels for defenders to have to throw the ball 50, 55 yards across the field, especially if they have to repeat that a number of times through the game. I know you've all had turnovers that way on that cross field pass. This gets rid of that cross field pass. Now you've shrunk it. We're at maybe just outside the hashes here on a football field, and now it's a 20, 25 yard pass. The other thing that does is, and you're assuming on the overpass, if you're three across, they've shut the goalie, which a lot of teams will do to force the overpass. All right, on this as well, when a team is riding, a lot of times they're in some kind of zone ride that's shifting side to side as the ball goes side to side. So when the ball's over on this side, they're riding, they've got everybody shifted over to that side. When you throw an over and get it to this side, they shift everybody over and cover up this side a lot better, right? By pinching your guys and just having one shorter pass here, you flip the field a lot faster. It's harder for them to shift in time to get over as you flip the field. That's the reason to have two guys down instead of three. You can shift it. Even if you threw through the goalie and didn't throw an over, that takes even longer. Goalie to here takes a long time to flip the field. By that time, they flip their ride. So this is the way we were playing. This is year one. This is our second game ever as a varsity program at Penn State. And this is the way we were clearing at the time. This is actually a successful clear, which was, uh, I think we cleared it about 65% in this game. They did a really good job riding. This was the game, our second game ever as a varsity team, where we came home and we're like, we got to think through our ride a little bit more and started changing. Our very next game, we switched to bonus. That goalie couldn't throw a clearing pass to save his life, so we had him always fake the attackman like he was going to throw it to get the attackman out of the way. That's what he was doing there. So here we're three across. We've got the middle of the field wide open. It's pretty stagnant. There's not a ton of movement. We're just looking to reverse it. Here we do get it out. But we were living on the edge all day, and as Penn State adjusted, we started struggling a little bit more. A couple things here skill-wise that I want to highlight that we're going to talk about that are important no matter what ride, no matter what clear you're using. Uh, one is the pass that we use to get it out here over the attackman in a tight space. We call that a dink, a dink pass. So here we're reversing it, but it's this pass that number 13 here, Rob Healy, is going to throw to Doug Bryant. It has to get over the attackman's outstretched arms into a tight space because somebody else here is coming up to ride. And then the other skill there is catching the ball coming back when you catch a dink and going immediately two hands to one, going two to one, because there's going to be pressure coming behind you. So you've got to get to one hand on your stick to get past that pressure, get a shield up, and then once you get past it, you can get back to two hands. So important skills to work. So that's the way we, we did clear it. Went from that, that's the way it was set up there. To this, the big difference between the bonus I showed you is that we sub uh, all of our poles off except for one and put a midi in the middle here. And again, we're, we're, our thought process there is we're gonna clear it at such a high rate that for the once or possibly twice in a game that we don't, uh, we're not gonna be hurt by not having enough poles on there. We're going to be able to find a way to sub those guys on, or we'll play defense with you know, one less. We'll be able to sub at least this guy on. Uh, we'll, play, we'll play defense with four shorts for a second if we have to, if that's only going to happen once a game. So uh, getting into it, how we get into it. I told you we're emphasizing transition now. So you know, we're breaking out a little bit differently than we were. We didn't uh, last year, in the first three years as a, as a program, we weren't breaking our pole upfield. We were getting him off the field. We didn't want him catching the ball going up the field. We weren't breaking this midi aggressively up the field. I showed it as this midi and not the deeper one because 
You know, it's the old rule that if, uh, if somebody alley dodges you and shoots and you break up field right away and that guy who just shots momentum is coming this way and you can get up this way, you're usually going to be wide open. So, uh, so that's why I showed that guy getting up the field assuming that that was coming off an alley dodge. A lot of times the guy getting up field might be if something was happening down here offensively, might be this guy getting up field. But the breakouts we're looking for are still the standard guys going to the, to the corners here. All right, so we got the banana cuts. I don't really care how they make those cuts. They don't have to make them at certain arcs or anything. They just got to get back to GLE or deeper so that they're getting away. They're getting some separation from the attack thing. All right, we have a defenseman who's subbing off immediately. He might turn and look really quick, but then he's just getting off. Our pole is getting downfield. There's a couple reasons for that. One is we want poles who do generate transition. So if he gets wide open, we want to hit him. He's got to be wide open, but we want to hit him and get some transition. The other is he often has the best offensive midi. He's often with the best offensive midi. We want to take that offensive midi and get him into their defensive half and try and trap him down there. All right, so that's, that's why we're taking him down there. We don't want him drifting towards the box where they can sub that guy. Okay, and then we have one midi getting deep right away and the other midi is leaking and he can go anywhere in here. A lot of times a ride will drop so fast and press their attackman up here that they'll just leave a guy wide open in the middle here. And if we can't see the guys downfield open, we'll hit him in the middle and let him run it out. All right, so, uh, and we need D middies who are comfortable with their sticks and can run it out. We have a progression that the goalie goes through as he makes a save, just like a quarterback goes through his progression on every play. And his first look is upfield at this attackman. If we're one up and two back, what this attackman is doing, as soon as he makes a save, he's just seeing which side this defender's standing on him. If the defender was here, he'd be going that way. If the defender's here, he's going this way. But what does a defender do first when that save's made? Nine times out of 10, he starts dropping, right? And if that guy just, if the defender was on him and just starts dropping a few steps and he breaks over here, that's a pretty easy clear. We're just gonna throw it right up. And Robbie Zanino, who's our goalie, starting goalie last year, is now really good at making that look. He does it all the time. Uh, so we want, we want that attackman to read which side his defender's on, break straight down the line opposite that guy if he's not open or the goalie can't make that look because he doesn't see him or they have an attackman in his face and he can't make the pass comfortably, he's dropping and getting out of it. Our attack is not involved in the clear. They're out of the way. All right, so those are our first moves. His second look is either of these guys coming downfield. He's scanning probably upfield, then right to where the shot came from if it was a midi to see if that guy's broken past his guy. He's looking at this guy as well. What he doesn't want to do, he can drop these in or he can throw them on a line. What he never wants to do is throw to a guy breaking downfield and have the ball land anywhere near midfield. If he's going to hit those guys, he's got to hit them in this area. We don't want to hit them up here where there could be defenders waiting for him. Not that they're going to get lit up like the old days. That doesn't happen anymore because you're kicked out of the game if you do that. But it's a turnover probably. Yeah. We're going to talk about that as we get down here. Uh, and then assuming none of those downfield options are open, we're throwing back. And now we're in bonus. All right, now we're in the clear. <clears throat> so here we are. Guys have all broken out. Our pole now, we get the ball over to Frisco side. We've talked about this before. We call the box side Boston side. A lot of teams do that. We call the other side of the field opposite box Frisco side. It's a really easy way for our guys to know exactly where we're talking about. We call the middle of the field Iowa. Uh, so it's the country. It, it makes sense logically once our guys learn it. So, we get the ball to Frisco side. The reason we're getting it to Frisco side and getting our middies to Frisco side, again, is we want to trap their offensive guys on the field. So we want to get them as far away from the box as we can. And this is where all our sub action is going on. It gets really crazy and busy up here. So we want the, we want the ball over on this side. If we could have thrown up and these guys can get out without having to throw back, great. But now we're in it. So here's our deep guy. He's going to the pinch spot. Call that a pinch as well because it's pinched in. Uh, our leak is going up and wide on sides. The D guy who came off is getting, uh, is getting subbed for a midi who's going to the bonus spot, that spot in the middle. He's coming off as soon as he sees that there's no pressure down here. Once these guys have the ball and he sees that there's not a couple of attackmen up on them, 
he's getting off. And that should happen really quickly. As soon as he sees it, he's just looking. The ball's there. The attack's downfield. Bang, he's gone. He's full sprint. Looking back, just in case we've got to throw it to him. But he's full sprint off. And then these guys are balancing the field. And it's a mistake they make sometimes when we're first learning this, is they'll kind of stay in their positions and stay on this side of the field. They need to drift over to about the hashes so that they can reverse the field easily. The pole, and I'll talk in a minute to your question about how long we keep him on. But what's happening now in the ride, a lot of rides are, whatever they're doing with the attack, whether they're dropping everybody back or playing two across or one down uh, or, or you know, whatever they're doing, the attack can be doing all different kinds of things. Nine times out of 10 in the ride, they've got three guys up here who are zoning across, right? So as, they, as we get the ball up Frisco side, up this side of the field, they've got to get their zone and honor this side. We have two short sticks on this side now. As the ball comes up the field, they've got to have their two shorts honoring those two shorts. So their offensive guy who came up with the pole now is probably going to have to start drifting over to cover this side. If he comes right off with the pole, we're going to have two shorts versus one short up here. We'll get it out easily every time. So he's got to start drifting over this way. It's why we set it up this way. It's why he delays. Once he's over and the ball's over on that side, he can sub off. It will probably trap that O MIG. All right? They've probably subbed their pole on. He's probably stuck here at that point. Then our next. On that last one. Yeah. Yep, happens. Uh, and if the you know if teams scout us, they know what we're doing. We do the same. So, you know, they might even do something like have their attackman stand at this angle, so that he won't allow a pass. And and you know we can still we can drop this guy deeper and throw back. It's really hard to stop. So that is yeah, but yeah, but that that does happen. We're still going to get it to Frisco side to start the clear as quickly as we can, unless we can get it right out this way. What you want to be careful of is after the first pass throwing really quickly to anything that's happening up here, because there's so much subbing going on here that uh, you can look, it can look like somebody's open, but somebody's subbing right behind them, and they're not really open, because somebody's going to come in right behind where you threw the pass. We want to really push Frisco side before we attack ball the side. And we usually can. Now, we might not get it to these shorts right away, because they, they're going to cover them up. The way we ride, we always cover those shorts up first, and then drift back over. Which brings me to why we then do this next part of it. If we've got their guys, their attack now, had to honor these two middies who are coming up this way probably. So most teams will shut those guys with their two attack until they get into their ride, and then they'll get, uh, and then they'll, they'll flood back over. Now as they're flooding back over, if we break this first midi down towards the ball, we call that a maverick, and throw right away to him, He's going to end up, again, nine times out of ten, he's going to end up with maybe one attackman right in front of him. And if we, and we're putting our best athletic middies in that spot. That's our punt returner guy. If he can't run by one attackman, he's not one of our best middies. So that should be an automatic clear. It is an automatic clear when we do that. A couple teams have scouted us on that. Drift back over faster or leave one guy over in this space and shut that. That's fine. If he's shut and he can't get it, he just comes up. And now we're in bonus. And now we have a series of things that we do in bonus. The first move we do is get it back to the Frisco side after we've seen what happened at Boston and start our push-pull. And we'll do this two or three times, uh, this motion that we have right here with the middies on that side. Throughout the whole clear, we can throw to the guy <clears throat> at Iowa any time. We'd rather use that as a last resort. Because again, once they get set into their ride, usually their pole will be somewhere here in the middle. He's probably covering these guys. But if I can avoid it, I don't want to throw to this guy looking this way where he's going to turn right into a pole stepping up to him. If we have to, we can. Or if we see that they're so deep that he's wide open here, great. We'll throw right to him and he'll step out. We just have to make sure now we only have five guys back. There's always only one of these three can go over. Right? Only one of those five can go over. So we have to be pretty coordinated there about who's going over and who isn't. If we do throw to Iowa and we're in the middle of this push-pull, right, he's, he's coming up 
on the push, he just have to stay up so he can go over. He practiced this enough and it becomes second nature for the guy. So. All right, so we do the push-pull. The reason we push-pull is here's the dink pass. So if they have an attackman covering this spot right here, by coming across, and if we're good at throwing those, he's pressing up here a little bit, throwing that little dink pass that I showed you, now they have to honor that by bringing one of the middies over to cover that. Right? If he cuts up now, and these guys are pinched, it's important that they're pinched, if he's cut up, now this next guy has to come all the way up to cover that. If he's behind him, we can throw to this. That we call a J cut. The reason we call it a J, I just talked about, is we don't want to catch and just turn, because there's probably somebody right behind us we want to make a J pattern, so we're catching and turning away from the pressure as we come up, uh, as we come up. And it's just drawing them further away from whatever we're doing on the other side of the field by doing the push-pull. It's also important that we get this guy in because if he stayed here, his guy could split these pretty easily. By coming up, this guy can't cover both. He can't cover the dink and this one. And that's what pulls them across. <coughs> We don't get it there because they've done a good job flooding over and covering it. We reverse it. We're pinched and we only have two down. It's a really quick reverse. It's a quick pass. We've got the field reversed in a second. These guys get back. Got to get back on sides for him to be able to go or he has to hold long enough for him to go. And then once he's back, he can go. You just have to have your five back. And they just have to be coordinated down the line to do that. And we're doing the push-pull on this side. It's the exact same thing. If they've done a really good job flowing over and they've got to cover 60 yards here, we won't have anything. If they haven't, we will. And then the last time, we do that twice, and then the last time, by now we're probably at 21, 22 seconds on the clear. We're getting towards our 30. The last time we send it over, we just add the slant. So we're doing the push-pull again on that side. The guy who had just pushed here is slanting, and that will completely open this guy up once we've got them flowing. If you did this really early, it can work, but if you make that what you do every time, they're gonna adjust and cover it. If you make it, you know, as, as your last thing, then it's a lot harder to adjust and cover. Uh, and we do it always from the Boston side because these guys are no midi suits sometimes. And these are the guys we want making these kind of cuts. And what happens here is sometimes we have this slash guy open. If not, they now have to cover with one, two, three middies. This guy's drawn this midi so far over now with this slant cut that now if we just reverse it one more time and out, or even skip it out to this guy, who could maverick back a little, there's nobody there. We can get right out. And we'll show that. And then we gotta finish the clear, and this is an important step. It's not really finished until we have possession. Uh, Casey talked a couple sessions ago about our sub game. Once we finish the clear, see if there's any transition. We then get into our sub game, but we have to get to the point where it's being possessed by our offensive guys before we're in the sub game. A lot of times we end up clearing it out with our D middies. Or there are some really rare, but there are some times that our D or goalie might have to bring it over. And in this clear, that's incredibly rare, but it can happen, right? And so just we drill and drill and drill on if we can just get it to the attack, great. If they press out at all, because maybe we have a D carrying it over, uh, then we immediately read that and cut through and show, show from the next guy. And almost no team can press out all over the place and be successful. The next guy's going to be open. So that's, and if he was covered, if this guy got there in time, he would immediately cut through. The next guy would show. What we want this guy carrying the ball to do is to keep carrying down. And it's these guys' responsibility to cut through and show to give him help. We don't want him turning back. The reason we don't want him turning back is a lot of times there's pressure coming at him from the back side that he can't see. He's going forward, you can see what's going on. We'll have good guys in front of him who are making his pass easy. But we've got to instantly read that, cut through and show if they press out at all on our guys bringing over. That's how we finish a lot of our clears. One adjustment is uh, if a team presses up on us, this is right after our breakout. So we haven't gotten into bonus yet. We've just broken out. Our pole's deep. Our 1D has come off. Our two middies have started to drift deep after their initial breakouts. And we read that they've pressed up on us or they've gotten into a 10-man. We have an easy call. And basically, it just means everybody comes back. And that's, that's a frantic, easy, easy, easy. 
Now, if we know a team does that sometimes, some teams do it in certain situations. Some teams do it uh, pretty randomly. Some teams do it without even knowing they're doing it. Their attack just are in suddenly a situation where they all end up pressing up because that's where they ended up standing at the end of the play. Uh, and if we know that that may happen, then we'll tell in the scout before the game that every single time we clear, we check easy. On the way down the field, we check back, give a listen, see if we need to come back. But if they do press up and we bring four guys back to the ball, somebody's open and we can get it out. So this is an example uh, of us setting up bonus. Have a restart here. Right here we're setting it up. We're flooding Frisco side. Their attack is all up here. They had to come with the Iowa guy. Here comes our midi subbing in, and all he has to do is run by one guy. And he's over. I think we cut it here, but I think we got a decent shot off it, too. Might have. But it's, uh, again, I'll show it. So he didn't need to come down here. He was being cautious. He should be subbing off a little quicker than that, that defender, because we have the other two guys in. We haven't balanced the field yet. We're not perfect here. But we do a nice job drawing them over to the Frisco side and getting it out with that Maverick guy. This is a, an example from this fall showing the push-pull once we get into kind of the full bonus setup. So here they covered up our guy coming in. We didn't have it. So now the ball's Boston side. We go Frisco side. There's the push pull. He throws to the push and drops it. But throws to the push. But you can see the uh, how difficult that is to cover when the two guys move like that. Our Iowa guy is in early. They have to respect him because he's a short. When you run this with a long in the middle, again, like Hopkins does, you don't really have to cover that guy. <coughs> right? If they have a long in that Iowa spot, if they're going to throw to him, he's got to come. Shorts have got to stay so he can get over. And we have a pole sitting in the middle of there that can step up on their pole. That's why we don't have a pole there anymore. First we did, and now we don't anymore. Uh, some of the terms that we use. I told you uh, the positions that we use. Boston is our box side. Iowa is the middle. Frisco's opposite box side. Coffin is the deep corners. If we ever need to throw to the deep corners, yeah. At Iowa, if you're going to hide an extra pole within that tier somewhere, where would you At the bonus go? spot. Okay. At the Iowa spot, right in the middle. Which is how teams that run this clear, 90% of them at our level do put a pole there. That's where that guy would go. Uh, coffins of deep corners, we might have to throw to the coffins if they get into a bump ride where they're bumping their defensemen up off their attackmen to help with our middies doing all the push-pull stuff. If they bump one of their D guys up to help on those, it's not really a 10-man because they're not fooling their goalie out. If they do that, then we might have to spread our attack out to the corners. We'd have a coffin call so that they know to send the ball to the corners. That's where it's going to be open. Um, these are just some terms we use in our clears that we wouldn't use in this ride very often, but or in this clear very often unless we're going against a 10. Um, the zero is our, is our shot, right? If we're going against a 10 man, we might shoot at the length of the field, hopefully about 60, 65 yards for their goal. Um, and when we do do that, just a note, if you're going against a 10 man and you decide to shoot against the 10 man, shoot for the top crossbar. Don't bounce it. All right, doesn't matter if you miss, you're probably going to have the backup. If you bounce it, the likelihood of them being able to catch it or get in front of it is a lot higher than if you shoot for the crossbar. Okay, you're probably not going to hit the crossbar, you're probably still going to miss the goal, but you have a much higher likelihood of getting it through their defense to the end line, and you may still score. Uh, the dink is our touch pass over the attackman. We practice that a lot. The J cut, as I said, is that cut to the ball on our push pull. We want to curl away from that and go two to one for a second to protect, assuming the pressure is going to come from behind you. Easy, everybody back to the ball. Maverick, I mentioned, is our call for following pressure towards the ball. 
if they are in uh, a ride where their attack is back at the midfield line, Here's our goalie and our D, and they've got their attack riding here, and here's our midi. These are our guys, right? We might throw over here, and as we're throwing over here, this attackman might jump up on us, right? And try and surprise us. <clears throat> Happens a lot. We've got to make an immediate maverick call, follow that guy down so that they can't then come cover him with the next guy so that he knows to catch and throw immediately to where he hears that maverick call, right? So uh, that's just our term for coming back to the ball on the clear. But in those situations, that's an automatic. If they press up on us, we just follow it. A couple drills that we do. Uh, this is a dink drill where our <clears throat> we're just practicing that dink passing skill. Uh, we're doing it on both sides here. And in this one, we have a, a rider at the cone here as well. We have an attackman and a midi here. We're going to throw the dink pass over the attackman, but we're going to also release this guy so that as we catch it, we're getting squeezed quickly. So we've got to drop this into a narrow window. We can't just throw it deep here because he'd pick it off. Uh, and he's got to catch the dink and protect the ball. About reps. This is early in the fall. These are probably some, some of the freshmen here have probably never really done this. So they're learning a new skill. So this is a great way to practice that skill. And as they get it down, they have to get good at throwing these 15 yard passes. They get over potentially a pretty tall attackman right into that little window. And again, enough reps, they get good at it. That one was too high. And that's what they're learning to do. Another point I didn't make uh, while that's on there, if we do throw to the J, really, really important. So here we are coming up the sideline, and we throw up here to this midi who made this J cut, and this other midi was in the dink spot. If we do throw to that J, this midi's job is to get down the field fast. He can't stand here. If he stands here, we got a guy turning where his guy can come off and they can get a quick double. If he's, if he's in this space, that's a really hard play to make. If he goes deep immediately when we throw to the J, if they do double now, it's an easy headband pass and we'll actually get a break off it, probably a four on three break off of it. So that's, that's an automatic. We throw to the J and the dink just keeps going. No, it could go either way. Wherever he, wherever he feels less pressure. A lot of times he's going to end up curling towards his strong hand. That's the direction he's going to go. Uh, this is us just running the clear and, and just that push-pull part of it. So we have the bonus guy here, but we're not going to use him. We have attackmen in riding. We have middies in riding. If you want to make this tougher, you make the three middies who are riding, give them all poles or have poles do it. So now there's less space. Uh, and just, just make it a little bit tougher so it's easier in an actual game situation. And we just have these two lines and the guys are going to throw back and forth and they're practicing the push-pull motion. And trying to gauge when they actually see guys open, when they are open, when they're not open. In this one, we have the goalies on one side and the D on the other because the goalies are usually going to be on the Boston side. But we can, you know, you flip it because it could be on either side of the field. But this is, uh, again, every single time it's going to be in a goalie and a D in this position. So you could just be practicing the skill with 2D, but in this case we want the communication so we have a goalie in one of those spots. In this drill you could have guys, every once in a while you can have the attackman jump up and create a maverick situation. Uh, if, the, if these guys in the corners, these middies get good, they can start reading their attackmen. Attackmen will usually sell that by starting to lean before they start coming up. If they see that, they can start calling Maverick early.
but kind of goes to uh, how we like to practice everything we do. We want to practice down to its simplest form first and then build up to the entire clear. We're always, every fall, we're a few practices in before we even run a clear. We're just doing the skills and then we're adding a little bit, another piece to it and another piece to it until we're comfortable clearing it. You get the idea there. And then before we ever do full field stuff in the clear, we do this a lot, we'll run three quarter field, ride clear stuff, where we're just doing sixes, but we have the sidelines set up like it's, a, like it's a game situation. So we have the right sub people in for both the ride and the clear. Um, we have the offense run. We want it to go quickly, but we have them run a little bit of offense. We want them moving and rotating so that we have to run the clear from different spots. Our guys aren't always standing in the same spot. Maybe it's invert, maybe it's an invert, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's a heavy rotation, they've had to move around. Then we just take a dummy shot and get right into it. And if we can hit somebody on a, on a transition type pass, great. If they ride that well, we'll change up our ride in this. If we ride that well, then they're going to have to get into bonus. So it's a situation where we can, can read and react uh, in all different situations. But again, we're practicing it without the guys at the other end. Um, just to focus on what we're doing down here first before we ever add those guys because it just adds another complicated factor before we add those guys. Same reason when you're developing a six on six offense, you, know, you start with the individual skills you're going to use in that offense before you ever get to six on six, then two on two stuff, then three on three, four on four, whatever. And you build up over the course of days, sometimes weeks, before you actually get into six on six. Yeah. Well, you got four days, five days. So that's which is better than none, right? So, uh, so use use the time you have. I mean, none of us ever think we have enough time. Still build it up, and and it's again, you know, what you just said. We have a lot more time than you do, but what you just said is a great reason why you keep everything really simple and. And by keeping it simple, you can focus on the skill development and player development that's going to make such a bigger difference than what you're running. And, and that's, you know, in that first, that dink drill, that's what we were doing. We're, we're working on skill development, player development. And, uh, and it fits into what we do. We're not going to do something that we don't do. But, uh, but that's what's going to make us a better lacrosse team. Same for you. And it, it just makes sure that what you're doing fits into what you do. Right? Develop those skills. A little bonus here. Wasn't going to do this, but I had a little time, so I added it. Um, this is how we clear the ball man down now. Uh, and, and just wanted to, to walk you through this. We just changed this up. But a uh, couple things that we've always done. One is when we make a save on man down, we always break the short stick back and throw the ball to him behind the goal um, just to get him the ball. A lot of times, if they're in some kind of off ride, we can get right out that way. We'll just throw it to our short. And, and let him slalom out. We're clearing a side for him. We want him going up Frisco side. Uh, so that might be all we need to do is just throw back to him. Um, we get three of our poles off. One of them's a little bit delayed. He's going to go over the line first. Two are getting off. And one is staying around the middle here. If he gets up, uh, he, we also have an attack up. Sorry, that attack's going to come across the line. That's why we bring that one first defender over first so this attack can come over. Um, if we can get it to him from this midi, we're not really looking from here. It happens too fast here for that. But if, if this midi's coming up and he can just head man it right up to that tackling because his defender didn't come over with him, great, easy. Nine times out of 10, that's not gonna happen. They're gonna have that covered uh, and come over with him. So, uh, so we won't get it, but we'll test it and see if we can get it. Assuming he gets stopped, they have an extra guy, they come over and flood this side and don't let him out. We don't want him dodging. We don't ever want our shorts dodging two guys who are kind of side by side. We, if they can slalom, if they're 20 yards apart, we can slalom them, great. If there's one guy, great, get by him. If there's two guys standing there, then don't try to run by him. Another rule, by the way, I didn't mention this on our clear, when we have on a regular clear, ignore this for a sec, but when we have the Maverick guy come in and we throw to him out of the box, we do not want him going all the way across the field. Sometimes you'll see guys catch it and run across, and then another attackman steps up and they try and get across him, and another attackman steps up and they try and get across him. We don't want that. If he can't get right out in this space, throw back and get back, get into the clear. The 
The reason we don't want that is uh, it's too easy to get turned and caught from behind doing that. We want everything going down the field. So anyway, in this, we don't have it. We throw back, and now we're testing the other side. And these three middies that we're subbing on for those three poles that came off are going into um, these spots, the Iowa spot, the Maverick down, and the pinch spot. So again, this is basically a, a piece of our regular clear. It's pretty easy for the guys to understand. The one change we do, and a lot of times we do this, and this guy can run it out, we're done. All right, almost every time, that's what happens. We get everybody flooded over to that side because that's a short with the ball, and they all think we got to stop this guy. We throw it back as quickly as we can, reverse the field. He catches it on Maverick, has to get past one guy, and he's out. If he doesn't get it, or if they cover it, uh, and he never gets it, or if he gets stopped and has to throw back, we just have a simple rotation. We have another midi ready to go in the box. Uh, he rotates to the Iowa spot. He rotates to the pinch spot. The guy in the pinch comes off. We have a 20-yard box here. This guy comes on, comes back down to the ball. He's always wide open. Has to be, unless this guy peeled off and the Iowa's wide open. So uh, this has worked. We switched to this last year. This is a Coach Brochard special. He came up with this, uh, and it's worked every time. So I got questions. Uh, so no fast breakup or transition. You want to change personnel. Personnel. What's your what's the general rule of thumb? For the ride or the clear? For the clear. You get in. You move it down the offensive side. Not a fast break. What, what's your transition mode? Or get different personnel. We have so uh, Coach Martin did did one. Uh, mm -hmm in one of our last couple sessions where we went through all of our different sub situations that we do. And that again goes to your philosophy. Do you want to trap guys in your sub game now as you're getting the right personnel on? And then how are you gonna do that? Do you wanna create offensive opportunities in your sub game? And how do you do that? Or do you just wanna sub and get your right guys on? And don't worry about them getting their right guys on. Uh, and those, you have to think through those scenarios and then decide how you're gonna do it. And there are, uh, and part of that is, you know, how, what are you, are you using two-way guys? Are they fresh? Can they attack? Uh, are your D guys who are down the field, your LSM or your D middies, are they good enough to attack offensively or do some things with the pick game a little bit? Um, there are teams that are very good at that, that make a living doing that. Loyola's national championship team had an amazing LSM. We did a ton of early offense stuff in the sub game where they left him on and did a lot of things to try to get them the ball. Their D middies did some of that too when they had Sawyer. So, uh, it, you know, it depends on your personnel and what you're trying to do. Let's say first that personnel, just get to the back in the corner and Like, yeah, don't let them sit in the corner, but yeah, unless they're not gonna pressure them, that's fine. But, uh, but yeah, just get, you know, we wanna get it to the attack, nine times out of 10, and then, you know, figure out what we're doing next from there. Now, what we talked about, we have a, we have a sub pattern that we're working on now that involves some picks at the midfield, some on the wing and some right at the midfield to one, try to trap guys, and two, try to create a couple easy opportunities. And we'll go through those, and if they work, great. Nine times out of 10, again, they won't. If they do, we get a really easy opportunity. If they don't, maybe we trap somebody, which is also good. Worst situation, we get RO on, we still have the ball. But it, it, again, it all comes down to what you really want to accomplish. Again, two years ago, we weren't doing any of that because we, we were doing everything we could just to make it go slow without actually sitting in the corner and holding the ball. We never wanted it to look like we were going slow, but we were. Yeah, what, uh, what does it take to be a great head coach? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> You're asking, asking the wrong guy. I don't know. Honestly, just uh, man manager skills more than anything else, especially at this level. A lot of manager skills. Yeah. How do you feel about, say you bring an attackman up to about 12 or 15 yards and leave the other two attackmen on the post, basically creating an L for offense uh, where you're clearing, basically like what Duke does. That way you have a point man up top and two. In the clear, you mean? Down, in the clear. Instead yeah, of having them so we, we've talked about that, actually. You could do that in different spots. And it's funny you say that because, um, so Denver does some of that as well. Uh, where they'll bring one of their attackmen all the way up to the midfield line and they're clear and they're early clear. And the thinking there is that if you bring a defenseman up with him, as they get transition coming down, the 
you have less numbers now down there, it's less crowded. So a lot of times the clear will run right past that guy. We brought a defender out to cover that attackman that's come up. He's there kind of as a decoy. If he's open, great, they'll give it to him and an attackman has a ball. If we cover him and they get past him, they might have a three on three down at the other end with only two defenders down there. And that's a thinking on a clear like that. And again, it goes to your philosophy, what your, what your strengths are, what your personnel are, what you're trying to accomplish. And what you have to be careful of is we've thought about it, but we don't want to do everything. We want to do what we do really well. So that's their thing. We're going to do our thing. But it's a, it's a great way to do it, too. It's, it can be very effective. Funny, when we were a club, Michigan State's club team used to do that when, uh, when Dwayne Hicks was coaching there. They did that, and they were good at it. And they, they brought an attackman up, and it, it created some problems sometimes. Am I right? Not, a, not enough problems. <laughs> yeah, almost enough though, yeah. almost enough. Yeah, the, the goalie goes Boston side because we're subbing that D. That beat that that Boston side D is subbing off okay. in bonus. Yeah, because he can get off faster. I figured, I just wasn't sure if it was the two guys. Did. No, we flip them. We flip them. Good question. Yeah, anything else? Awesome. Well, again, appreciate you guys being here. Thanks so much. What you guys are doing is so important, and, and, uh, and we appreciate it. So thank you. Have a great Christmas and holiday, and hopefully we'll